our surrender. Did you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Thank you, worship team. Awesome job, as usual. Well, for three days this past week, I had an amazing privilege of sitting around a big table with 10 other uh, pastors here in Israel, along with our good friend and a well-known author named Joel Rosenberg, who sponsored this gathering. And uh, we spent those days studying one book of the Bible, 1 John. And it was fascinating to get everybody's input. And uh, we do this every spring. We usually do a short epistle from the Apostle Paul, but this time 1 John. 1 John's very fresh now in my mind, and I feel led really to share from that text from a particular passage in 1 John chapter 4. So I'd like you to turn, please, with me to 1 John chapter 4. And I've entitled the message, Love is a Big Deal. Love is a big deal. You're going to see in a moment how big a deal it is, beginning at verse 7 of 1 John chapter 4. Are we ready? I hear the rustling. I see the pixels flying. Okay. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love God one another. Love is a big deal. Love makes the world go round, some people say. Some of you are obsessed with love. Your greatest desire is to find someone who will love you completely, unconditionally, and forever. And when you find that someone, you're going to love that person with all of your heart. At least that's the plan. And some of you have found that kind of love, and you hope and pray that others will enjoy the same experience. When it comes to music, there's no subject more written about than love. I need somebody to love. <laughs> love me tender, love me true. Love me, now here's another one, crazy in love. Groovy kind of love. I want to hold your hand. Love makes the world go round, I think. I think of all the disciples, John knows the most about love. John describes the Last Supper in his gospel this way. He says, now there was leaning on Yeshua's bosom one of his disciples whom he loved. It's interesting, it's kind of cute actually, that John speaks in the first person about himself. I know an evangelist that talks like that. Can you imagine me, though, talking like that? Friends and countrymen, Pastor Wayne really loves you. I wish I could love you. No, I do love you. <laughs> Yeshua really did have a special love for John, and on the cross, Yeshua entrusted his own mother to John for her, his care. Uh, John entrusted to John, or God entrusted to John the writing of a large part of the New Testament. John, son of Zebedee, wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote three epistles, and he wrote the book of Revelation. John can write about love because he was so deeply loved by God. Now let's focus on the five verses that I read at the beginning. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. One of the first things revealed by John in our text is that love is the very heart of of God's nature. Love is the very heart of God's nature. There are a few phrases here that prove this. Verse 7 says, let us love one another for love is of God. And then in the next verse, at the end of that verse, John says, God is love. Love is such a big deal that love is the very heart of God's nature. Love was the theme of the hippie movement back in the 60s and the 70s. The slogan was love, not war. Free love was the lifestyle. But today we're still enamored 
with love. But you know, today there are a lot of people who doubt even that God loves. God is often accused of being indifferent to the fate of mankind. Or if God cares about the world, he's a racist. And some actually accuse God of being the cause of evil. Now the people immersed in the Greek culture in the first century of John's day would have found John's statement quite strange. God is love. The Greek philosopher Aristotle believed that it was impossible for any god to love mortal men. The gods have little regard for human beings. The pagans in that day believed that their gods lusted after women, but they never really loved them. The Greek gods were often angry. At other times, they were cold and indifferent. They were fickle. No one would worship a Greek god singing, Great is thy faithfulness. But the story of the Bible is a love story. And God is love personified. And what kind of love is revealed in God's story in the Bible? Sometimes it's the love of a father for his children. In fact, in Hosea chapter 11, it says that when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Psalm 103, verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. This is from the same book that we're studying tonight. As it says that God's love is not just for Israel, but for all his children, Jew and Gentile, and says how great the love of the Father lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Of God. In our text in 1 John chapter 4, we see that God demonstrates his love toward us in three main ways. He shows us his love through his goodness, he shows us his love through his grace, and he shows us his love through his mercy. Verse 9 of our text in 1 John 4 says that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So God demonstrates his love toward us by his goodness toward us. He wants us to live, and not just a meager existence. As the Gospel of John tells us, Yeshua has come that we might have life and have it to the full. I don't know about you, but since Yeshua came into my life, my life is very worth living. How about you? God makes it his business to be good to his children. Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Throughout the Bible, we see how good God is. And this shows us his incredible love. Joseph was able to say, even after many trials to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people alive. Deuteronomy 26 verse 11 says, So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you and your house. Psalm 73, 1, Truly God is good to Israel. Psalm 135, verse 2, You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. And Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Unfortunately, we too often take for granted God's love toward us, and we don't recognize how he's showing his love through that goodness. A mother found under her plate at breakfast a bill written by her little son Bradley, aged eight. It read, Mother owes Bradley for running errands, 25 cents, for being good, 10 cents, for taking music lessons, 15 cents, for extras, 5 cents, total, 55 cents. Now, that was quite a while ago. Inflation has, uh, of course, made those numbers a little higher than that. In, in real terms, that was quite a bit of money he thought his mother owed him. His mother smiled and made no comment. But at lunch, Bradley found 
the bill under his plate with 55 cents and another piece of paper neatly folded like the first. And opening it, he read, Bradley owes mother for nursing him through scarlet fever, nothing. For being good to him, nothing. For clothes, shoes, and playthings, nothing. For his playroom, nothing. For his meals, nothing. Total owing, nothing. You know, God is constantly doing good things for his children to reassure us of his life. Too often we have an entitlement mentality, the attitude that somehow God owes us something. It's his duty to bless us. Listen, God's goodness toward us is not a human right. It is an awesome privilege that you and I enjoy. God has no obligation to care for us. Because of our sin and our complaining, he has every right to turn his face from us and withhold his love. But God, the benevolent Father, loves us in spite of us. In our text, the word John uses for love is the Greek word agape. And John Stott says that agape love is self-sacrifice, the seeking of another's good at one's own cost. Again, self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice the seeking of another's good at one's own cost. And you know, the Father did that very thing For the sake of our good, he makes a self-sacrifice by sending his only begotten son to die for us that we might live and experience his goodness. Now, for some of you, at one time or another, you've probably been puzzled by the question, if God is so loving and so good, why do I have so many problems? Well, God's love is sometimes tough love. And Paul tells us in Romans eleven twenty two. 22, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. God one day described himself to Moses saying that he's abounding in love, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin with a passion. The father loves his children, but he must at times discipline his people severely. We shouldn't think that God's holy punishment contradicts his character of love. For we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and verse 10, that the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. But God disciplines us for our own good that we may share in his holiness. An American tourist was uh, visiting the Middle East, came across a shepherd and his flock, for, and for a few days, he observed them. And the tourists followed the shepherd one morning and found that he was taking food to one sheep that had a broken leg. He said to the shepherd, how did the sheep break its leg? Did it have an accident? No, said the shepherd, I broke the sheep's leg myself. You broke it yourself, asked the surprised tourist. Yes, you see, this is a wayward sheep. It would not stay with the flock, but would lead the other sheep astray. And then it would not let me near it. And so I had to break the sheep's legs so it might allow me day by day to feed it. In doing this, it will get to know me as its shepherd, trust me as its guide, and keep with the flock. God loves us, but it sometimes appears on the surface that he has a strange way of showing it. He might show us tough love sometimes. Now, it's not always our fault that we go through difficult times. I'm not saying that we have that... Uh, illustration of this in the story of the blind man. And the disciples wondered, it was it his sin or his parents' sin? And in that case, Yeshua said it was neither. In fact, the blind man was blind so that ultimately in his healing, God would get glory for the healing. There's a mystery. We don't always know why we go tri- through trials and tribulations. But what we do know, if we believe the word of God, And trust the testimony of many who have experienced trials and tribulations. That God is good all the time. Can you repeat that after me? God is good all the time. One more time. God is good all the time. Took some of you longer to get that, but um, you've got it now, right? Amen. The Bible is God's love story. 
the gospel is the good news. The gospel is God's spell or God's story. And it's a love story. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. William Dixon was a widower who lived in a small town in England. And not only had he lost his wife, but his son also. And one day he noticed that his neighbor's house was on fire. And the grandmother who owned the house was rescued, but still trapped in the blaze was her orphaned grandson. His name was David. Well, William Dixon bravely climbed up an iron pipe against the house, and he grabbed the boy and lowered him to safety. But Dixon's hand that held onto that iron pipe, that pipe was so hot that it, it, it scarred his hand badly. Not long after the fire, little David's grandmother died, and the people of the town wondered who would look after that little boy. Two volunteers went to the town council and offered to look after David. And one of the men was a father who had lost a son and wanted to adopt the orphan as his own. The other man was William Dixon. To argue his case that he was the most worthy of looking after David, Dixon said nothing. He merely held up his scarred hand. And when the vote was taken, little David became little David Dixon. God loves you, he loves me, he proved it with his scars. There's no greater love than this, than one would lay down his life for his friends. And in Yeshua's case, he laid down his life even for his enemies. There's no greater love than the love of Yeshua. He's proved it by his goodness and his kindness toward us. God shows his love through his goodness, but he also shows his love through his grace. So let's talk about his grace now. Verse 10 reveals God's grace. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Not that we loved God, but he loved us. Usually we love people who are lovable. We love talented people. We love attractive people, good-humored people, people who love us in return. But this is not gracious love. This is not the kind of love that God has for us. God's love is gracious love. It's love for the unlovely, love to the unattractive, and love to the unworthy. It's spontaneous. It's uncaused by anything in us. When it comes to love, God makes the first move. Later in verse 19 of the same chapter we're studying tonight, John will write these words, we love him because he first loved us. God loves us because he's chosen to love us, not because of something within us that makes us worthy of his love. Why did God remain faithful in his love for Israel? Moses explains to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to his forefathers. So God chose to love Israel not because of something inherently good or great, in the children of Israel, he doesn't love because of anything other than his own decision, his own oath to love. There's no because. He just loves. Because it's the heart of his nature to love. Now, it's interesting that one of the Aramaic targums, one of the Aramaic translations of the Hebrew text that could have been in existence at the time of Yeshua, in the time of John, and they used to read these Aramaic translations in the synagogue because most people in Yeshua's day didn't understand Hebrew. And so they would have to hear it in their mother tongue, which was usually Aramaic. And it's interesting, the same verse that says God didn't choose you because you were, you were great, this is what it says in the Aramaic translation. It says this, verse 7 of Deuteronomy 7. It is not because you are prouder than all the peoples of the Lord that he desires you and was pleased with you, for you are meeker in spirit and humbler than all the peoples. 
And Rashi admits that this was a common view among the sages in Judaism. But believe me, God didn't love the people of Israel because they were meeker and humbler than all the other peoples on the earth. As John says about all of us, Jews and Gentiles, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. It's amazing, really, that God is so gracious in his love toward us. For in our fallen natures, we are so often unfaithful in our love toward him. An illustration of God's amazing love is found in the book of Hosea. I read earlier about uh, how God expresses his fatherly love toward his people, also in the chapter 11 of Hosea. But also we know that the, mo the, the central story in that prophetic word was the story of a man's love for a woman who was an adulteress, became unfaithful to him. And God calls that husband, Hosea, to, to woo and pursue her until she returns to him. And what this story reveals is the amazing love and grace of God. What the story reveals is that God goes totally against custom and reason and woos back a worthless woman. Despite the fact that Israel has broken the covenant, God will still seek her out and bring her back to himself, even though she has broken the marriage covenant. God will bring his godless covenant people back to himself by beckoning her with his love. God's love is a seeking love, seeking of his own volition. We love him because he first loved us. He seeks out those who are lost and finds them and draws them to himself. Hardly a moment after he created humankind, God demonstrates his grace by seeking out a rebellious, sinful man named Adam. He calls to the man, where art thou? Adam was not looking for God, by the, by the way, at this time. He was trying to run away from God. He felt the shame and guilt of his sin, but God was seeking him. Where are you, Adam? I'm looking for you. I'm coming after you. Aren't you glad that God is like the hound of heaven who comes, he's going, he's going and looking for us and wants to find us to rescue us and bring, him, bring us to back, back to himself. None of us can claim that we have earned God's love or that by our striving we are able to find God and convince him to accept us. God finds us. As Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that anyone can boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Thank you for your gracious gift. Appreciate that very much. There is no more powerful demonstration of the grace of God than the fact that God sent his son. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. You know, if it weren't for God's grace, heaven would be a ghost town. Because of God's grace, we get to live together forever. And we're going to be easier to get along with when we get there. So grace is loving the unlovable. In a sense, God's grace involved facing the ugliest, most unlovable part of us, and that's our sin. And yet he chooses by his grace to love us anyway. But the reality is God cannot ignore sin God is a righteous and just God. To be fair, he must carry out judgment against sin. And this is where a third demonstration of his love comes in, and that's his mercy. John describes God's mercy in verse 10, at the end of that verse saying, God sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. In your translation, it might say propitiation. We'll say atoning sacrifice, because I'm not sure I could say that word twice in a row. We can't really appreciate the love of God until we appreciate the wrath of God. 
One of the reasons why many of us can't appreciate the love of God is very few people talk about the wrath of God anymore or talk about his judgment against sin. And so we don't know how good the news is because we don't know how bad the good news, the, the, the news would be if we remained in our sin. How many of you would agree with me? We need a little more preaching on the judgment of God against sin. I've seen two hands raised so far. Maybe I didn't ask the question clearly enough. But the Bible tells us that through the prophet Nahum, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. You know, God does love us like a husband loves his wife, and he's a jealous husband. And too often he catches us running after other loves. He's a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. That's what the Bible sa says. The wrath of God is the natural chemical reaction of his holiness when confronted with sin. So how is God able to love us and yet carry out his justice, his wrath against our sin? To understand this, we need to know what John means by this atoning sacrifice or propitiation. On Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the high priest would sacrifice two goats, one on the altar, the other called a scapegoat, he would release into the wilderness until he died. The high priest would place his hands on the head of the animal and confess Israel's sins, and in so doing, there was a transfer of Israel's sins to the goat. The high priest would then sprinkle the blood of the goat seven times toward the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of the Lord dwelt between the cherubim. And thus, by this bloody ceremony in the temple, Peace and fellowship was restored with God. God is a God of mercy. He has compassion on his people, knowing that we are too weak to keep his laws perfectly. He takes pity upon us. Uh, he, he has mercy upon us. He has compassion. Through the sacrificial system, the holy God has, has his justice. He is able to pour out his wrath upon the sacrificial animal and have his justice and teach the sinner a lesson because the sinner gives up something. Either the animal or he pays for an animal to be sacrificed. He, he loses something. It costs him something so that he recognizes that sin is costly. But because he doesn't sacrifice the sinner, then mercy is shown. And the loss is much less than the loss would be if we, our lives were taken because of our sin. Thankfully, because of God's mercy, we are pardoned and we are set free. In Yeshua and in his sacrificial death, as prophesied in the Old Testament, we have the most profound revelation of God's love as he shows mercy for sinners. We have in the person of Yeshua the ultimate scapegoat for our sin. By being the final atoning sacrifice, Yeshua has opened a new and living way that we may approach the mercy seat of God. The cross is the watershed of history. Down one slope flows the blood of the Messiah's punishment for our sins. and Down the other side is our pardon. Tonight, you and I can be assured of God's love. He's proved it in his goodness. For as John tells us, it's not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And tonight, we can be assured of his love because he has demonstrated his grace by taking the initiative to seek us out and to woo, him to, woo us to himself. And tonight we can be assured of his love because he's demonstrated the greatest act of mercy toward helpless sinners by voluntarily becoming the atoning sacrifice for our sins. I think this is good theology, not because I'm preaching it, but because I'm telling you what the Bible says about this thing. But I want to tell you, good theology is only head knowledge unless we learn and live out what we have been taught in theology. And John says to us in verse 11, this is where we get down to the practical application, the so what of this message. In verse 11, he says, now that you know that God is love, 
you've got a responsibility. What is it? You ought to love one another. You ought to love one another. Loving others is a big deal to God. In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, Yeshua quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4, and then adds Leviticus 19, 18. We read the story in verse 28 and following. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In the new covenant, there is no lessening of the law of love. In fact, it's intensified, and it, and it extends beyond our next-door neighbor. Yeshua says this in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 43 and following. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect." And Yeshua is talking about being perfect in our love toward others. In 1 John chapter 3, the same book we're studying, but in the chapter previous to our text, we read these words in 1 John 3, 14 and 15. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In our short text in 1 John chapter 4 verse, 4, verse 8, we read something that I hope jumped off the page when I read it earlier. He says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Nowhere in the scripture does it say, if you love your brother, then God will love you. If you love your enemy, you shall be saved. But the Bible clearly teaches from Genesis to Revelation that if there is no love in our hearts for our neighbor or our enemy, clearly it means that we have never known God. This is clear. And this may take us by shock tonight, at least some of us. As we think about our neighbors and we think about our enemies and what our attitude is toward them tonight. But this is what the scriptures teach. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is a very big deal. So big that if we don't love him, we are not his children. There's no one who could argue against such a command to love Others, almost every religion, every philosophy practically requires that people should love one another. The problem, however, re with religion and philosophy is that they offer no adequate model, nor do they give us an adequate motivation to love. But God himself is our model for loving. Because God desires what is good for his children, because we have his nature, then we ought to love by showing goodness to others. God himself models how to love in the way that he is gracious to others. He loves those who aren't necessarily lovable at all. People don't deserve his love, and yet he loves them. And because we have his nature within us, as his children, in, made in his image, we ought to be gracious toward others. 
Thirdly, because God's love is demonstrated in his mercy, then you and I need to be merciful with others. We must be quick to forgive those who hurt us. And when the disciples wondered how often one should forgive, I mean, what? I mean, you can't just keep on forgiving. They keep messing, messing with you. You can't keep forgiving. And in one case, Yeshua says 70 times seven. And we know that the number seven is a, a number speaking of perfection and completeness and fullness. And Yeshua is saying, you need to fully forgive without limit. Forgiveness to the fullest. But not only is God our great model how to love, he is also our great motivator for loving. As John will say later in this chapter in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. When you realize how much you are forgiven, how much I'm forgiven, shouldn't that make it easier for us to love others and forgive others? John Stott said, no one who has been to the cross and seen God's immeasurable and unmerited love displayed there can go back to a life of selfishness. Now, you and I can't love in our own power. Even if God motivates us, just looking at him and he inspires us to love, that's even not enough, is it? But if we realize that we can't do it on our own, and if we will do what we've been learning in our discipleship series on the Holy Spirit, if we will ask daily to be filled with God's Spirit, then something amazing will happen to us in the fullness of the Spirit. What is the promise? Romans 5 verse 5 says, God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Are you praying daily now? So I'm trying to remind you, and Wednesday nights we're trying to remind you to ask for the fullness of the Spirit moment by moment. If you're doing that, I believe that the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and many of the other fruit might simply be, a, be details about what love really is. If you're being filled with the Spirit on a daily basis, there's going to be a, a, a gusher of love that's going to spring up within you because it's the love of God poured into your hearts through the Holy Spirit. As God's love gets poured into our lives, His love, let's open up the tap and let's let it overflow to others. Close your eyes, would you? I'm going to read a passage of Scripture from Ephesians chapter 3, and it's a prayer for you tonight that the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, prayed for the Ephesians. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and deep is the love of Messiah, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Amen. Amen. Can you stand with me? Would you just uh, lift up your hands like this? You don't have to, but I'm just going to ask you to do it. You don't have to reach even above your head, just like that, and maybe make a, a cup formed in your, with your palms upward, which is simply a physical act of a spiritual reality that we need the Holy Spirit to be poured into us, onto us, into our cups, even overflowing with the love of God. Some of us need a fresh baptism of love, an infilling of love. Maybe it's for our spouse, our children, maybe our parents, maybe a fellow member of this congregation, maybe a fellow worker, student, a flatmate. It might be someone who hates you with a passion and maybe a persecutor. But God can pour out his love into your heart.
heart today in a fresh way and love not only your neighbor, but even your enemy. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming tonight and meeting with us. Thank you, Yeshua, for your words that out of our belly will flow rivers of living water. And you were speaking of the Holy Spirit. We believe, O oh God, that you want to pour your love afresh into our hands, that we might be able to reach out and touch the hurting, that we might be like you in showing our love in goodness and kindness, in grace and in mercy. Let us be your body here on earth that goes about the land doing good. May it be, O oh God, that people will look at us in the way we act and the way we think and the way we, and the kind of attitude that we have and say, I don't get it. What is it about you that causes you to love people that I can't love? And we'll be able to point to Yeshua and say, He's our inspiration. And say the Holy Spirit is our power and motivator that moves us to love and to be living letters, the body of Messiah, reaching out and touching a lost world. I pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Worship team, lead us in worship. As we encounter the Lord's love this evening, let us just respond to him one more time with this song.